What? Are the girls here? Your girls. Yeah, they went back. <laughs> My daughter went back last Sun Saturday. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought. She had a lovely week. Oh, did she? Right. Good, good, good. Good, good. In Leesburg. What a lovely place. It is really nice. Yeah, I was just there at the outlet. Ready? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We've got two special guests um, this afternoon, and uh, we're going to get right started, and I'll introduce to my left, far left, Patrick Jepson. Patrick is a consultant, journalist, author, these two books right here, and New York Times and London Sunday Times best-selling author based in Washington, DC. He's a published authority on corporate and personal branding, addressing conference audiences worldwide. Patrick owes much of his communication experience to Princess Diana, who chose him to be her private secretary and chief of staff. He served the princess for eight years, from 1988 to 96, responsible for every aspect of her public life, charitable initiatives, and private organization. He traveled with her to five continents, working with government officials, up to heads of state, and encountering figures as diverse as Mother Teresa, Margaret Thatcher, President H.W. Uh, Bush, the Emperor of Japan, Hillary Clinton, and the King of Saudi Arabia. He also accompanied the princess when she was hosted by Mrs. Dole at the American Red Cross in 1995. His tenure covered the period of Princess Diana's greatest popularity, as well as the constitutional controversy of her separation from Prince Charles. In recognition of his service, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II appointed him a Lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order. It's the first time I've ever been in the company of someone <laughs> of such distinguished uh, service. To my close right, to my close left, excuse me, the Honorable Mary Jo Jacoby, Patrick's wife. She's a global expert in the worlds of energy, finance, and government. Her career spans the White House and Wall Street, Westminster, and the City of London. And she's created two award-winning global brands, managed three of history's well-known corporate disasters, and became the only person ever to be appointed to office by two U.S. presidents, a prime minister, and a reigning monarch. Okay, yet another <laughs> first for me, okay? She has UK government experience with the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments and Her Majesty's Civil Service Commission. Her Washington, D.C. experience included being an assistant U.S. Secretary of Commerce under President George H.W. Bush and special assistant to President Ronald Reagan. Today, she's an independent consultant advising clients on building their brands and safeguarding their reputations, helping them conceive and apply a full spectrum of crisis avoidance strategies. We know we, we need to hear more from Mary Jo about that. Mary Jo's clients have included Royal Dutch Shell, BP America, Lehman Brothers, and Drexel Burnham Lambert. Mary Jo was an executive vice president of BP America in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon tragedy. We're going to have fun this afternoon. <laughs> OK, so, so much, so rich here. Where to begin? Um, what I thought we could do is sort of start with lessons learned and just share with the audience maybe just you know, a snippet, a few minutes of your overall experience and the jobs that you've had, and maybe some lessons learned to share with the audience. Patrick, we'll start with you. Thank you, Sharon. I thought ladies go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're outnumbered. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. Lessons learned. Well, there are so many, actually. Um, but just a few that come to mind. Uh, when I um, uh, was growing up, I lived in Ireland. And I was then sent away by my mother to a boarding school in Scotland, uh, which was um, a very uh, a formative experience. And some years later, I came across this wonderful expression in, a, in a, a book by the novelist Simon Raven, who says that the purpose of a British private school education is to teach little boys that life is not fair. Hmm. Well, if there's one lesson I learned, it is that life is not fair. Uh, and I think that's quite relevant to a lot of public debate right now. Right. 
Um, it's not supposed to be fair. It's how we respond to it that matters. And I've also learned um, on good days, and especially on the not-so-good days, that even if life is being unfair, one thing I can control is my attitude. And even if I feel I've lost everything, that I have nothing to look forward to, that the, uh, the sun may not rise tomorrow, at least I can decide how I'm going to cope with the challenges that I'm facing. And that, that uh, habit, I suppose, of adjusting my attitude, no matter how dire the situation, has helped me see over the years that for every disappointment, there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that the people I admire in life, um, very few of them famous or well-known, hmm. but they are the ones who manage to turn disappointment, tragedy even, into opportunity to enrich themselves and the lives of those they come across. That's one lesson. There are lots more. How about you, Mary Jo? I, I think I've had a, a rather interesting life from very humble beginnings. I grew up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast in a town of, at that time, 8,000 people. Uh, my parents owned a bakery, and my father made the stuff, and my mother sold it, and we lived in between. So the baking part was in the back, then the house, and then the shop. And I learned the value of hard work and economics. But what I also learned was salesmanship mm. from my mother, who was uh, a miracle worker when it came to selling my father's outstanding bakery products. I remember a time when a lady came in just two minutes before closing, and she had forgotten her son's birthday and wanted a birthday cake, and we didn't have any left. But we did have some donuts that had been sitting in the <laughs> shop since 6 o'clock that morning. And somehow my mother persuaded this lady to buy a dozen donuts for her son's birthday. And when she walked out of the shop, it was as if she had a bag of gold bullion. I mean, she was so happy. Salesmanship, but also relationships. Um, my mother was a bit of a politician in our little town. And uh, she knew everyone, and everyone knew her, and everyone knew all of her children. Um, and those relationships served her and my father. And to this day, I can go back to that town. The bakery closed in 1979. And people still talk about my daddy's bakery. Relationships. Um, I was privileged to meet both of the Doles, mm -hmm. who were not both Doles at the <laughs> time. Um, I met Elizabeth when she was working for President Nixon. Um, in 1973 when I went to work on Capitol Hill, and I met the senator um, in that same year, and I've kept in touch with them off and on. Uh, relationships through the years, you think people have forgotten you, and they haven't. And that has always given me the courage to ask for advice. Mm -hmm. um, and people love to give advice, but you have to ask for it. You don't have to take it. <laughs> but you have to ask. Right. And mentors, relationships and mentors are the things that have, uh, have been very important in my life. I started my working life as a secretary. And a lot of my successful women friends tell me, oh, you shouldn't admit that. And I'm no, quite I'm proud not. because it's not where you start, it, that song, it's right. where you finish. That's right. And I still, in meetings, take my notes in shorthand. And uh, when I was working for Drexel Burnham, and Drexel became the subject of uh, what was then the biggest mm -hmm. securities fraud investigation in history, people would ask me, what are you writing? Well, I'm writing what I need to remember, <laughs> and no court of law will understand. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. So the, the things you learn when you're young can serve you well later on. You opened up a great door there, and we'll, we'll go to you first. So you both are really our worldwide crisis experts. And I know you've handled so many, but is it possible to maybe just highlight and talk about one of the more memorable crisis, crises that you had to handle? 
Well, the statute of limitations has passed <laughs> on, on one of them, so uh, yes. Uh, Drexel Burnham. I left the Reagan White House to go to Wall Street to Drexel Burnham. And my colleagues um, in the White House were all very envious because Drexel was the most profitable financial institution in the world at the time. And I went in as a corporate vice president, which was a pretty big deal. And 11 months into my tenure, Drexel became the subject of, of a very large securities fraud investigation. Um, I think the biggest lesson that I learned is when the government of the United States decides they're going to get you, mm. it's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how much. Um, ultimately, we fought uh, the good fight for three years. We ultimately settled the charges. Uh, my colleague Michael Milken um, right. went to jail. He, mm -hmm. he pleaded guilty. How long did he serve? He, he had a, uh, 18 months. 18 months. 18 okay. months of, of a five-year sentence. Okay. Um, he's still a billionaire, though. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we won't feel too sorry for him. Yes, he, he, he's a lovely man, and he is probably the greatest financial mind of the mm. second half of the 20th century. Interesting. Um, certainly up there with, with J.P. Morgan mm -hmm. and others. Uh, but the firm sailed too close to the wind, and as I was leaving the White House to take this job, Don Regan was mm -hmm. chief of staff at the time, and uh, I was quite close to him and Mrs. Regan. And I went to him to say, you know, I have to recuse myself. I'm in discussions with Drexel. Uh, will you be a referee for me, a reference? Mm -hmm. And he said, sure, but you have to decide whether it will help you more if I say good or bad things about you. <laughs> because Merrill Lynch and Drexel didn't get along very well. Uh, and he said, Drexel sails very close to the wind, and one of your responsibilities mm -hmm. is going to be to try and help them not go over. Well, right. they ultimately went over. The firm went bankrupt. Um, but I learned crisis management, mm -hmm. uh, at the, as the British say, at the coal face. Mm. And uh, it went on to serve me well uh, at HSBC, at Shell, mm -hmm. and ultimately um, BP with mm -hmm. the Macondo's bill. Good. Well, you were with Princess Diana for eight years, and it was a pretty tumultuous <laughs> Yes, as the Chinese Time. would say, I, I lived in interesting times. <laughs> um, and it, it does remind me of one particular crisis that's perhaps worth sharing. Um, when Prince Charles and Princess Diana split up, it wasn't just a, a personal tragedy. Mm. It was a great national crisis right. and a constitutional crisis because unlike the American Constitution, and I speak as a proud new American naturalized <laughs> citizen, um, but in England, uh, there is no written constitution, which is both good and bad. Mm -hmm. It's very convenient in some ways, because if it isn't there, then nobody can <laughs> wave it at you. <laughs> or you can make it up and put it in and say, there it is. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful combination of statute law and precedent. And uh, an institution like the royal family, the monarchy, depends on precedent and tradition. We've always done things this way. Or what did we do the last time this happened? We'll use that as the model of what we do now. And that's important because the monarchy acts as a symbol of unity above politics. It exists to exist. Continuity is its big right. thing. And so when I was a keen and idealistic young naval officer and I saw the fabulous footage of Charles and Diana getting married in 1981, I thought, fantastic. There we are. That's the monarchy all fixed for my lifetime. But of course, some years later when I went to work in that uh, institution, I realized that what I was seeing in public was not an accurate reflection of what was going on in private. So when um, the Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons and announced that Charles and Diana were to separate, uh, the Prime Minister had to do it as head of government because it was a, 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 a decision of national constitutional significance. And it was worse than that because there was no precedent we could go and look up and say, oh, well, this is what we did in the old days, or this is what Henry VIII did, or this right. is... We had to do it. So as Princess Diana's chief of staff, her senior advisor, as her, her really her go-between with the other households, with mm -hmm. the queen and her husband and all of that, and 10 Downing Street, um, I had to be uh, very clear about the, the direction we were going in, because there was no 
There was no specific reference we could go and look up, but what we could do was set a direction. And I was reminded of something that, that Senator Dole said when he was uh, grievously injured, almost mortally wounded in Italy. He said in his, in, as he was recuperating, what he learned was not to mourn what he had lost, but right. to celebrate and use what he still had. And this was something that <clears throat> Princess Diana was very good at seeing. While all around, and if you look at any of the media from the time, there was doom and gloom, and this is what mm -hmm. we're losing and what now. But Princess Diana, uh, and it's a great female trait in my experience, um, was more concerned with what we still had, not uh -huh. what we had lost, and what we could do with it, which was enormously encouraging for me because I felt that the weight of this whole crisis was on my shoulders, mm -hmm. really. Um, but since she was able to set the direction of moral compass, if you like, then the rest, even though it was unfamiliar territory, even though, in fact, we were writing history every day, mm -hmm. I mean, this is now a precedent that may, God forbid, be needed in future. Um, we had a sense of direction. And I'm sure Mary Jo would agree that in the depths of a crisis, um, I mean, if you're anything like me, if there's a crisis, my mind goes blank. I freeze. It's terribly useful in the Navy if there was a crisis, you know, if the ship was on fire or you know, something terrible was happening. <laughs> I didn't run around and shout, which a lot of people thought they should do. I just froze. So people thought, wow, he's calm. No, I was <laughs> screaming inside. But on the outside, I'm calm. And you know, whether you're dealing with sailors or the media, um, they're going to look at your face. They looked at Princess Diana's face. They sure as heck looked at mine at, at that time. If you are confident about the direction you're going in, even though the day-to-day -day detail may be terrifying, it may be overwhelming, you may not be able to sleep at night, you can't eat, you don't know who to trust, you can't pick up the phone. I can tell you, in the depths of a real crisis, you can't even step out of your office. You can't go home. You have to make special arrangements you know, to get fresh clothes. I mean, it, right. it becomes very, very intense. But if you have a sense of where you're going and why, then I don't believe there's any crisis that you can't survive and indeed turn to advantage. I think that's the most important point about crisis management. Mm -hmm. um, when you're going through a, a giant personal or corporate episode, um, your natural instinct is to want to just get it over with, right. you know, get through it, and I'll deal with everything else <clears throat> after I'm through this. The most successful um, crisis experiences are those where those involved have a vision of what they want to be when it's over. Right. It won't last forever. The goal, yes, is to survive it, but it's not just to still be standing. It's to have changed, mm -hmm. to have learned from it, to have, be able to apply those lessons to the way you are in the future when you've come out of it. And that's successful crisis management. That leads me into the next one, um, the next question I had for you. So all these various, I mean, really, again, you, you two are um, global crisis experts. What would you say, um, could you point to sort of a lasting impact that it's had on you or your larger community as a whole? Well, certainly um, my experience with BP in the Gulf of Mexico, where um, I joined from London on day 10 mm -hmm. after the explosion, after, this, okay. after the explosion mm -hmm. and the tragic loss of, of 11 souls. And there were so many things going on right. that had to be dealt with. So we had the oil spewing in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. You um, have the loss at a of very lives. Rapid, we right. had the loss of lives and, and all of the, the events. The, the, those who passed away were not BP employees. Good they were Transocean staff, okay. but they were all working on the rig together and BP was the rig manager. Uh, so you had the loss of life, which was a tremendous tragedy of people losing their colleagues mm -hmm. and their friends, and uh, others who were on the mm -hmm. rig who survived, who were traumatized by it. You had the fire. You had the oil spewing into the Gulf. You had the communities along the Gulf Coast, which is where I grew up, which was one of the mm -hmm. reasons that BP asked me to come, that 
um, could see that there were going to be large amounts of oil eventually reaching their shores at right. the beginning of tourist season. You had a new president trying to mm -hmm. make a mark for himself in Washington with a Congress that was going into congressional elections. Mm -hmm. The midterm elections were coming up. It was the fifth anniversary summer of Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. which was the recovery mm -hmm. summer. Uh, and you had five state governors, I think it was three, who were up for, three seats up for election. One was not seeking re-election. So you had all of the politics yeah. of the state and events. the federal government right. and the politics of the Congress versus mm -hmm. the president, the politics of the localities versus their state governments, overlaid by a great tragedy mm -hmm. and by a running sower, which was right. the hole in the water. Right. Um, and when you're dealing with so many moving parts, it's very difficult to keep your eye on mm -hmm. what we're going to do afterwards. We're going to close the well eventually. It, it took, took a while. A couple of months. Yeah. Finally closed it. We're going to clean up the beaches. We're going to compensate those who have suffered loss. Mm -hmm. But the company must survive because although America accounted for a large portion of BP. BP is a British right. company and, and a big global company. And Mary Jo, let me ask you this. I recall there seemed to be, um, from that time, like a running clock. Was there this running, yes. right? Yes. This is what I remember from this period, that people kept on saying day 25 yes. of the BP spill. And that was like the top of the, every news hour that was like this running clock of how many days we had this oil spill. Yes. And you also had on CNN a split screen of whatever story they were presenting at the time and the oil right. spewing right. at the bottom yes. of the Gulf yes. um, with the day whatever. And, and this is it was the like image the I have. It was from like this the time. Iranian hostage yes, crisis. Exactly. It was day, day 275 exactly. of America exactly. held hostage. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very similar. The, the treatment was mm -hmm. very similar. And the politics, uh, I had been out of the country since Bill Clinton took office. Mm -hmm. So I left when that President Bush 41 mm -hmm. left office and moved to the UK. And I thought that I had kept in touch and understood mm -hmm. my country. Um, I became British while I was there, by the way. <laughs> uh, and when I came back to deal with this, uh, Patrick was in England. Mm -hmm. He could not get a green card because I didn't live in America. And so it was only until I moved to America. So I was going through 20 hour days alone with my, my trailing spouse, <laughs> not trailing yet. Right. Uh, and, you know, it, it tests everything mm -hmm. that, um, that you think you know. Right. And every reserve of physical and emotional mm -hmm. strength that you think you have. And um, it's hard. And what's ultra hard is when you can't control any right. of it because your natural instinct is to try and control. Right. And there, there was not one moving part in that situation that I could control. I could influence, right. but I couldn't control. Um, it, was, it was a very interesting, a very important experience, mm -hmm. not one that I would ever repeat. repeat. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you. How but about Mary, you? Well, I mean, Mary Jo raises an interesting point there about how exhausting it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that in my, um, uh, when I'm a consultant in individual reputation and crisis management, and one of the advantages of having gone through something like that, and in, in my case, um, being personally uh, a media story, that, that it does give, give you the opportunity to learn some basic, this is what you've got to do, do these five things. When your brain is, is either shut down through the strain of it all or being torn in 20 mm -hmm. different directions, here are five things you have to do. It's a little trick, actually. If you, if you ever see an individual who's in the, the vortex of a big media crisis, a big media story, chances are they decided that's where they wanted to be. Hmm. Most people who are the center of a big media story know that they're going to be, 
and either bring it on themselves or encourage it or try and exploit it. Um, there are occasions when you can't escape it, but even then, if you've got your antenna out, if you um, are, uh, if I can use the expression, treating it like a military operation, your intelligence should warn you when the attack is going to come, where it's going to come from, and you can prepare so that you can achieve the main objective, which is to emerge with credit at the end of it all and use it as, a, as an opportunity. But a very important aspect of that is to make sure that you are always keeping energy in reserve. Mm -hmm. Particularly when there is a crisis, not every crisis is huge, but a lot of people, for their own reasons, try to inflate the size of a crisis, <laughs> make it more important so that they look better or just because they live on drama. Um, don't ever be tempted to overreact to what is not a real crisis. Because when a real one comes along, you're going to need every ounce of, hmm. of energy. There is a, um, a tradition in, uh, uh, I think, in some of our best institutions and professions, not to panic. Stay calm. Remember those, those famous posters, keep calm and carry That's on? That's right, yes. From now, the those Brits. posters <laughs> were, were printed in England in 1940 in expectation of a German invasion. They were never actually issued. But in the moment of greatest mortal crisis mm -hmm. for the nation, they were just going to keep calm and carry on. It's a pretty good lesson. And if you are in a crisis or on the, on the, on the margins of a crisis, or if you think somebody is overdoing a crisis, ask yourself, are they keeping calm and carrying on? Because if they're not, you have to question their motives. If you're the calm one, you're the one who can still think. If you've been reserving some energy, if you've thought ahead, if you've used your intelligence, intelligence both in intelligence networks, but you're also your common sense, then you're going to be in a position to ride that crisis out and be the one who, who has a good crisis. And in building a career, notching up a few good crises, as Mary Jo has, uh, is, is gold bars <laughs> in your resume. <laughs> Um, I want to pivot a little bit to corporate social responsibility and really use some examples that we're seeing right now. Corporate social responsibility and, you know, just back to, to some of the points you just touched on about people um, basically stirring up trouble and stirring up drama. And I think we could probably use the president as, as some of those. This is a good example in the recent NFL. Um, but Mary Jo, but let's, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to you. Um, you know, if your client was United Airlines and um, they dragged, you know, you were working for them while they dragged the doctor off the plane, how would you advise them? To respond much more quickly than they did. Mm -hmm. Um, it was an interesting situation for United, however, because it was not actually a United Airlines aircraft. It was wearing a United badge, but it wasn't a United Airlines plane, and it wasn't a United Airlines crew. And the ground crew um, mm -hmm. in Chicago were not theirs either. But, you know, for the world, they were United. Right, right. And the lesson there is if, if your logo's on it, you own it. Right, exactly. Uh, whether you actually own it or you not. You take the blame. And, and you take the blame. Right. And you explain what you can, knowing that behind you as chief executive, on your one side, you're going to have a Mary Jo, a, a corporate communications, corporate mm -hmm. reputation advisor. And on your other side, you're going to have your general counsel. Right. And the Mary Jo is going to be saying, you have to say this. And the general counsel is going to be same. saying, you're, you cannot say <laughs> right. this because of the lawsuits. Right. And the CEO. The advice that I give to my corporate communications clients is make friends with your general counsel early and right. stay friendly That's with right. him or her forever because they're the most important person mm -hmm. that you will need. The chief executive has to be able to decide who is giving him or her the best advice and how then to deploy right. it. Uh, and what we know from United and from other big crises, the media are going to find the chief executive's beach house in Florida, the multi-million dollar beach house, and they're going to show that on the news mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the passengers are paying too much and look at how he's living. And 
the first thing that the chief executive needs to keep in mind is nothing you say or do is ever going to be enough. Right. But don't make a bad situation worse. So let's talk about this CEO, because I thought others can um, um, comment, but I thought that um, it wasn't very helpful, his comments. It wasn't. And then he doubled down. Right, and it took an awful long time for him to apologize. He listened to the, to the general counsel. He did. They were not his employees. <laughs> he couldn't fire them, right. even if he had wanted to, and he probably shouldn't have anyway. Um, but he, he listened to the general counsel. We need to get the facts. Yes, we need to get the facts, but you have to acknowledge what the situation right. is, how the situation looks. And... Certainly from, from my days, early days of, of learning about crisis management, things have changed tremendously mm -hmm. because every crisis now unfolds in real time and on YouTube and Facebook. Right, and it's recorded. And so even before United had a chance to respond, we all saw the video, which was just awful. Because it's being broadcast <laughs> right. in real time. Right. And I would bet that the United CEO didn't know about that for probably an hour after. Yeah, that's a pity. <laughs> um, and so how the company uses social media, how the company monitors right. social media, how a, a visible individual right. uses and monitors these things are very, very important. Yes, and actually I'm, I'm reminded of, to, to stay with the same industry, um, one of the things that, that was lacking in that response was basic common humanity. Oh my God, I am horrified this has happened. <laughs> I don't know the facts yet, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it, and I'm going to get back to you, and I don't know. <laughs> that was all it took. There's a, there's, there are two examples which I'll quickly quote, but they are very, very um, uh, evocative, really, of, of how to get it right and how to get it wrong. Some years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a crash, uh, sadly, of a, uh, an airplane belonging to a small British airline called British Midland. Great little airline, mm -hmm. and it, it was a wonderful, inspiring story of a young boy who loved airplanes, and he grew up to run his own airline, and it was loved by everybody. It had a wonderful um, reputation mm -hmm. until it had this terrible crash, and it could have been worse. There was a suggestion of pilot error, maintenance problem. Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong, and more than 40 people were killed. Mm -hmm. And the CEO, the guy whose child, actually, this airline was, got out in front of the wreckage while it was still smoking and was visibly moved. He was dignified. Mm -hmm. he, was, he had expressed appropriate emotion, right. remorse. And The Economist magazine turned it actually into a bit of a case study of by reacting in the right way, in a human way, he turned a tragedy into an opportunity. He did actually benefit from it in terms of his own reputation. Right. By contrast, just last year, you may remember that very sad German wings crash where the co-pilot went nuts and flew the plane into the mountains. Yes. Another case where it was a subsidiary of a bigger company, mm -hmm. and the bigger company tried to pretend that mm -hmm. it wasn't their problem, and eventually they were dragged, it seemed, that they dragged the senior uh, uh, management to the crash site where in a rather um, stilted little ceremony, the senior executives laid wreaths at the crash site. Okay, a bit of damage control, could have been better, but they're trying. Except, walking back to their big limousines, two of these senior executives were photographed wiping their hands. Yep. Actually wiping their hands. So for God's sake, you may have all these fabulous plans for what to do when things go wrong. Point one, the real disaster will not be anything like you've practiced, but point two, be human, even if you then have to pass on the day-to-day -day running of the crisis right. to somebody else. But you, as the representative of the company, you have to show appropriate emotion quickly. So, Patrick, um, you know, the theme of um, the discussion series is women engagement and, and how corporations and political candidates and communities engage women. You worked for one of the most visible working moms mm. in the world. Talk to us a little bit about what that looks like and, and your views on 
working women and engaging women in the community and Yes, I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, and I should just mention, I came from an all-male family. My mother died when I was young. Uh, I then went to an all-male boarding school. I then went to an all-male college at Cambridge. I then went into the Navy at a time when it was only men, particularly at sea. Um, and suddenly I found myself working for the most famous woman mm -hmm. in the world, and she was my boss. And I learned an awful lot of things very quickly, but one of them was, I would say, how to work for a woman. Uh, and I'm still um, benefiting from a lot of those, those lessons. Um, one of the things that is worth remembering about Princess Diana was that although she had this gilded life, the life mm -hmm. of extraordinary privilege and luxury and uh, profile, she was underneath it all. She had come into a very demanding position as a teenager. Um, and was uh, thrown into the deep end of a traditional male-dominated organization, although the queen is boss of it. Take it from me, it's a male-dominated organization. And let's just remind everyone how old she was when she married Prince Charles. Well, she was, she was, she was 19, 19 when she came onto okay. the scene. She was um, 20 when she married, and uh, therefore very, very yeah. young. Right. And we read about Prince Harry and Prince William. Now, Prince William this year is the year his mother was when she died. Right. Um, most of what she achieved, she achieved before she was the age Prince Harry is now. So right. very, very young. And so like a lot of uh, young working women, and I'm blessed to have two fabulous young working daughters, so, uh, as well as the, the um, advantage of being able to learn so much from Mary Jo, I also learned from their experience um, that uh, there are particular um, expectations of women that uh, I know Princess Diana found very uh, challenging initially, but she overcame them all through finding fulfillment in her work. Mm -hmm. And we don't have time really to discuss it all, but suffice to say that she faced a lot of disadvantages from an, an unsupported work environment, uh, a lack of... Um, a network of supportive co-workers, uh, tradition, as I say, very male-dominated. Her mistakes were broadcast all over the world. Her successes tended to be discounted by her own management. Um, but she found within herself the strength to decide what it was that she had to do with the position she found herself in. And that brought her happiness. Uh, but I find that when I watch my my daughter's going through many of the same mm -hmm. stages. Um, what gives me great hope is their determination and their absolute conviction that, and it's a well-founded conviction, that they can do better than any man can at what they do. And therefore, I'm pleased to say they have never considered themselves to be oppressed okay. or a minority or in need of special help. Mm -hmm. um, as I said to a, a former client who asked me, what do I do if I'm asked to do something beneath my pay grade? Mm. I say, well, a you, a, you do it, and B, <laughs> um, as a general rule, it's better to be known for what you will do, not for what you won't do. So um, uh, Princess Diana got to, know, got, got to be known for what she would do. Right, wonderful. And my daughters, I hope, are doing the same. Mary Jo quite plainly has. Uh, and that is something that I would emphasize over and over again. Good. Good. I know that um, it's almost time for Q&A, but um, I have one last question for both of you, and I think it's important, particularly for the students. Um, you know, we've got lots of things going on around the world. We've got um, the young man, the engineer from Google was fired. You know, we've got all this, um, what we could term PC rules in work environments and corporate environments. I'd love for both of you just to take a minute to to just, you know, predict any future trends. What do you, as, you know, students here, what do you think they could or should expect in the workplace in the future? What are some future trends? What can they, should they expect? What shouldn't they expect? I think whatever you think it's going to be, it is not going to be that. <laughs> it is going to be something of your own making. Um, the world of work has changed radically in the 40-some years I've mm -hmm. been in it. Um, it's going to change 
more radically and more quickly for y'all than it did certainly for me. Um, I, the most important thing you can bring to any work situation, whether it's your work in university or your work at a job or your work as, as an entrepreneur, is self-belief. I can do this. Um, there have been many things that I've done that I had no idea how to do it. When I convinced HSBC to rebrand the entire group as HSBC, it took me two years of petitioning the board to get them to agree to it, and then finally they did, and they said, swell, Mary Jo, now you're going to do it. I had never done branding work before. Um, the internet is a wonderful thing. I didn't hire any consultants. We did it with a small team, and we got it done. And we learned a lot from it. And we won awards, and then I went on to Lehman Brothers and won awards there. Uh, whatever you think it's going to be, it isn't going to be that. And I will tell you, the single most important thing, especially for you young women, take the chip off your shoulder. Mm. It is not attractive. It is not winning. It is not going to help you. You don't have to go along and get along, but Malcolm Baldridge, who was Secretary of Commerce for Ronald Reagan, was, was one of my first bosses. And he said, Mary Jo, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Now, I still haven't figured out why I want to catch flies, but <laughs> he is right. Honey works better. Smile. Mary Jo, get me a cup of coffee. How would you like it? You know, it, it doesn't hurt me in any way to make somebody else happy, as long as they're asking me to do something that's reasonable, ethical, and moral. And going in angry with a, with a grudge, with a chip on your shoulder, um, is, is the ultimate effect is going to make you much more unhappy and it is not going to help you advance. And the other advice I would give is ask. I asked for advice, and I got it, and I got some wonderful advice from some wonderful, very famous people uh, in my time who are still friends today. Um, and ask, what do I have to do to make it to the next level? Watch the people who are succeeding around you and learn from them. You're not going to copy them because every situation is different, but learn for them, from them. Pounding the table won't get you very far in the long run, um, but asking and learning will. I've also got two pieces of advice, probably, and again, they're directed uh, to, to young women, as I have already advised my, my daughters. Um, the first is... Don't fall for this idea that men are all some great monolithic block with one brain between them. <laughs> Take it from me. Men are all different. And I say this to my women clients. Um, when they say to me, oh, it's so difficult. You know, it's a male-dominated environment, and I'm the only woman in this, and I'm the only woman in that. You know, get to know these men. Contrary to what you've been told, they're not dangerous, and they're not all bigoted, and they're not all sexist and stupid. They're actually quite nice people, some of them, or they may be uh, insecure, mm -hmm. they may be ambitious, they may be scared, they may be ill, they may be, they are everything that, that mm -hmm. actually a normal human being is. And if you are, can, can get down out of your um, pram for a minute and get to know them, A, you can turn them into allies, and B, you can show them the way, because they need it. And again, speaking as a man, <laughs> all the greatest inspiration, the best examples, uh, the strength that I've received has come from women. I've been very, very fortunate. Um, and the only bit I would add to that, but it is related, um, it is not a sign of strength never to admit you got something wrong. Hmm. And I think there is a tendency now to think that we can't admit we're wrong. Um, and indeed, it's a, it is a reproach to any organization that doesn't allow its employees, its members, to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Being wrong the right way is an enormous benefit. Mm -hmm. It's a great strength. Princess Diana, <laughs> of course, in the royal family, everything is perfect all the time. <laughs> Quite early on in my time there, I thought, geez, 
I've done something wrong, she's going to find out, I'd better make sure that she hears from me. So I went to her and I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I've made, a, I've made a mistake. She said, what? I said, yeah, I've made a mistake. I did this and it's okay, I fixed it. She said, what? I said, I fixed it. She said, no, no. She said, you admitted you made a mistake? <laughs> she said, that's the first time anybody in this place has told me they made a mistake. It's okay to make mistakes because, and I will finish on this because it's a great quote. Good decisions come from experience, which comes from bad decisions. Excellent. Wow, this is wonderful. Thank you both. Thank you both. I know that um, it's time for Q&A, and I'm sure we've got lots of questions, so let's get right into it. Somebody have the, here's the mic. Oh, Emily has the mic. Questions? Fire away. We've stunned them in silence. <laughs> <laughs> Don't all rush to the mic at once. Thank you both for being here today. How do you determine where you can make the biggest impact in life and in crises? How do you determine it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how you feel. And you, uh, particularly in, in life, in a crisis, that's not your own crisis, um, you can, sometimes it's only on the margins that you've made an improvement, that someone has followed your advice or they've, they've limited the damage, and usually it is about damage limitation. Um, but in your own self, um, you, after a while of being out there, you develop your, your little beacons of if this happens, then I will have succeeded. If that doesn't happen, then I will have succeeded uh, because I've contained that bad thing that I didn't want to happen. Uh, and it's all very personal. I'm, I'm often asked, um, particularly in university and school environments, you know, how do you measure success? I will give you my one measurement of success. Um, when I was working for President Reagan, I had the accidental opportunity of introducing my daddy to the president. And, you know, my daddy didn't even finish high school. And here his youngest child is special assistant to the President of the United States. And um, we were at the White House and I was breaking the rules, taking my father on a tour of the West Wing, which we weren't supposed to do in the daytime when the President was there. But it was Christmas. And I figured I might not be there for another Christmas. So. <laughs> You know, let's, let's force the moment. And, um, and the president was coming through uh, to go to the Situation Room, and he saw me and my, my father. And he came over and uh, shook my hand and said, Mary Jo, why haven't you left for Christmas yet? And I said, oh, well, I'm leaving today, Mr. President, but my father's visiting from Mississippi. May I introduce uh, Lawrence Jacoby? And the president took my daddy's hand and put his other hand on my father's shoulder, and he thanked my dad for letting me work in mm. the White House and uh, told my father what a great job I was doing. And, you know, then he went on his merry way to the Situation Room to solve some global crisis, and my dad and I went to lunch <laughs> in the White House mess. And um, the look on my father's face, you know, they, my parents were from humble origins themselves, and and uh, they wanted the best as, as parents of their mm -hmm. generation, as parents of every generation do. They wanted their best, the best for their children. To have given my father that moment, then and since, I figure, you know, I can die a success. If I don't do anything else, and I've gone on and done many other things, um, and it's two prime ministers now <laughs> rather than just the one, uh, but I gave my daddy that moment, and I got to see it. And, you know, you measure it in, in your own self and in your own heart, and it isn't money. Hmm. Money, you know, yeah, you can buy stuff, um, but you don't need it. And it's, it's something that matters to you where you could make a difference in someone else's life. And, and I'm fortunate I have a few of those mm -hmm. kinds of examples where I know that I made a difference. And all the corporate crises and, and all the awards and all the money 
And those are the things that matter the most. Thank you. Yes, that's pretty profound, and I wouldn't disagree with it at all. <laughs> and I think that that story is lovely. I, I question, really, the, the whole idea of measuring your own performance. Mm -hmm. um, other people will do that for you. Uh, for it's yourself, um, it may take years, decades, to know if something was right or wrong. I find now, and I wonder if I've done okay, it's tiny little things, mm -hmm. small memories about interactions with other people, where just once or twice I did the right thing when I could have done the wrong thing. Um, I'm afraid there are plenty of those too. But, but uh, there is a, a belief, I think, that you have to be easy on yourself, don't be too harsh on yourself. Well, I tell you, brought up as a Scottish Presbyterian, being harsh on yourself is what you learn <laughs> with your first <laughs> mouthful of salty porridge in the morning. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, over time, it's that ability to think that um, you did more good than harm um, that, that ultimately, I think, probably lets you sleep at night. And Mary Jo is absolutely right about the money aspect. Um, I was trying to think of a way to say it, but um, doing things for the money uh, is almost always going to backfire on you in some way. Um, but Considering where the absence of money is can be, very, can be a very powerful, mm -hmm. positive guideline. Um, I'm going to do this despite the fact that it's going to pay me less. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting measure of success. Why am I doing it, therefore? And is that going to make me a better person, feel better, happier? Uh, that's, that is a good way to look at money. Mm -hmm. Consider the absence of it, not the presence mm -hmm. or the desire for it. Yes, because money is, is transient. I lost everything when Drexel Burnham went bankrupt. You know, most of my savings were invested in the firm. It was a privately held company. The, there was no liquidity, and most of us lost everything financially. And I lost a good chunk of my reputation because Reagan White House to Drexel Burnham, my job was to defend the firm in Washington, and it turns out they were seen to be a bunch of crooks, mm -hmm. so that didn't make me look like the paragon of honesty and, mm -hmm. and virtue that I was. Um, you can get over it, and you can make the money back. But what you cannot do is get over the damage that you let things do mm -hmm. to you inside, um, because that stuff will eat at you. So it's the little things where you've made a difference for the better in someone else's life it's the decisions that you made that, that didn't go as badly as they could have. And you can always make the money back. I would just add to that. Um, very often I have found the things I thought I wanted, I didn't get. Instead, I was given the things I needed. And I realized that those are the things I really wanted all along. Mm. But you don't know it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight's a wonderful thing. You mentioned the importance of like public figures looking human, and that was something that like Princess Diana was very good at, but I think that when we look at politics today, a lot of this generation isn't really seeing that. So how do we, as the next generation, hold um, them accountable for looking human and acting human in their policies? Sometimes they look a bit too human. <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to get out there, and you, you know, here you are in this wonderful institute, learning um, wonderful lessons every day from fa fabulous lecturers and professors. And it's, it's ultimately on you to make it change. And every individual can, can contribute to that change. You've, you can vote. You know, we, the first day of early voting, Virginia has some um, off-year elections. We, had, we elect a governor this year. And we went and voted on the first day of early voting because we wanted to make sure we got to vote because we don't know from one day to the next when a client's going to call and say, I need you in Saudi Arabia, I need you in Malaysia. And you go. And if it's election day, guess what? You've missed the opportunity. Voting is the only responsibility we have as mm -hmm. Americans. And it is a responsibility and a privilege, and it matters. And when you see the numbers of how many people didn't vote and how much of a difference 
not nationally, but, but precinct by precinct, mm -hmm. um, county by county, state by state, and how much, how much difference a few votes one way or the other could have made. And you realize that it does matter. It matters to get involved. I was always fascinated with politics. I never thought I'd work in politics, but I spent a big chunk of my life in it. Um, it matters, and you, your generation has a voice that is different because you have social media. You can be a news reporter right. with simply your phone. And Facebook Live. And you know, you, <laughs> right. can, you can impact thousands, millions of people if right. you choose to from the comfort of your living room. Right. Um, and that's an awesome power and a terrible responsibility. Use it wisely, but use it because it's important. You get the leadership you deserve at the time you deserve them. And you know, I look back at the presidents I've known, and I've known a lot of them. Um, and I've known a lot of them personally. And uh, they were all, well, all men so far, but men of their time. And we have a, a president of our time. And we had, in my view, I shouldn't go there, but a, a flawed candidate for the other party. And it wasn't her time. And it will never be her time. But that doesn't mean it won't be a woman's time right. soon. I would only add to that, speaking of women politicians, I mean, I, for much of, of uh, my um, to early working life, Mrs. Thatcher was prime minister. Hmm. This, it's, it's easy to forget now what a revolution that was, hmm. particularly in the male-dominated um, parliament in, in London. And I think that it is a great sadness that uh, uh, women, particularly those who form opinions um, today and particularly uh, getting engaged in the, the political debate, they seem to ignore Margaret Thatcher. She was such right. a trendsetter, a trailblazer. I had the privilege of meeting her many times and I had the privilege of uh, uh, inside, uh, insight into how she led the country during the Falklands War. Mm. Now, that was a task which would have defeated most people, man or women. And this thing about being human, she knew she had to be inhuman in a sense, but what she knew she had to be was a leader. And if you're a leader, regardless of gender, or hair color, or height, or size of hands, or anything else, if you're a leader, people will know it. They will see it in you, because you have a vision, like Senator Dole, like President Reagan, and all that matters is that you can communicate that vision to people in such a way that they will commit themselves to bringing that vision about. And if there is a shortage of anything at the moment, it's people in public life with a vision that people want to follow and the ability to communicate it honestly, and not just through social media right. or clever PR people. Right. We've been clever PR people. We know uh, the, the, short, the, the, the limitations of that. Genuine leadership comes from taking risks, um, taking the big picture, and having a sense of, I would say, uh, uh, moral certainty that is lacking elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You can't lead unless people are willing to follow you. That's right. So, but in order for people to be willing to follow you, they have to understand where you're trying mm -hmm. to take them. And that's a communications issue and an inspiration issue. We can talk about Margaret Thatcher as long as you like. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> can I tell a quick joke? Yes. Sorry, forgive oh, me. Oh, be <laughs> careful. No, no, it's a very good British joke. humor doesn't always no, no, translate. <laughs> so, so Margaret Thatcher is taking her cabinet out oh. for dinner. And um, they're in the restaurant, and the waiter comes to take the order. And he goes to the prime minister and says, uh, and what, what will you have, Prime Minister? And she says, I'll have the steak. And he says, very good. Uh, and the vegetables? And she says, they'll have steak as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. A 
joke, not a, not a true story. <laughs> a lot of people think it's true. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes, ma'am, we've, we've made you wait too long. <laughs> Women who have confidence and grit and determination likely are going to become engaged with politicians and corporations and um, communities and, and, and yet, how do politicians, corporations, organizations and communities engage women who may not recognize that they have those abilities or, or is it the responsibility of those groups to engage women? Is it the responsibility of the woman to become engaged? How can we, how can we get more women involved? The answer is yes. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> it's, it's both parties' responsibility. Um, it is the, the organization, whether it's a company, whether it's the Congress um, or an administration, um, has a responsibility to all of its staff to help them succeed and to help them develop themselves right. to be the best that they can be. That's in the organization's interest. That's in the shareholder's interest if you're a company. Mm -hmm. The individual also has a responsibility to do his or her best, to speak up, to make her voice heard, uh, when she has something to contribute, um, and to be a positive force, a force for good in the organization, to help the organization change. Um, at picking up on something Patrick said, there is, forgive me gentlemen, there is no star chamber of men sitting around in a room <laughs> thinking every day, what, am I, what can I do to keep the women in the company down? <laughs> they're not thinking about it. You know, they're, they're thinking about the whether they have union issues, they're thinking about where they're going to move the company next, they're thinking about the quarterly earnings report that they have to produce. They're, they're not plotting against us, ladies. Um, it might be easier if they were, because some of them are not that bright. Uh, but, you know, we have a responsibility to speak up. We have a responsibility to be constructive, if we have to criticize, to be constructive in that criticism. Um, and it is our duty to get involved and to be an active participant, not just to go in every day and draw a paycheck. Right. Um, that's, that's the easy part. If you're ambitious, and this is true for you men as well, you, uh, the advice that I was given in my very first job out of college was this. You have to do the job better than anybody's ever done it, and everybody has to like you. And it, is, it was true then, and it's true now. They don't have to love you. They don't have to want to go down the pub with you every night and you know, see you on the weekends and be your best friends. But they have to not dread the moment that you show up in their doorway. Mm. And that's your responsibility to not be that person. And we all know somebody like that. Oh, here they come again. <laughs> you know, what am I going to say now? You have a responsibility not to be that person. And as management, I, when I was a manager, when I was a corporate leader, I had the responsibility. If you were that person and you were reporting to me to take you to one side and offer you some constructive criticism outside of your performance evaluation, it's the more flies with honey than vinegar conversation. And it's the company's responsibility, the organization's responsibility, and it's the individual's responsibility. And it's actually a friend's responsibility, too. You know, Mary Jo, when you were in that meeting and you got all upset and angry, that wasn't your finest moment. It devastated me when someone said that to me. And I learned from it, because I had to be told but I had to be willing to learn and change. And I would, also, I would only add to that, if I dare, um, <laughs> that, that man or woman, if your route to success or acceptance or um, what you consider to be your rightful place uh, goes through entitlement, hmm. then your, your compass is off. Hmm. If you're entitled, 
things have to change to accommodate me. Right. If they don't understand, you're looking at the wrong side of the mirror. Or the wrong end of the telescope. Or one of those things. <laughs> Look at yourself first. Is there a wrong side of a mirror? I haven't found it's it Like yet. it's <laughs> crying wolf in a crowded theater? <laughs> but it's like every time I think somebody else is getting something wrong, I've learned, look at yourself first. It's probably me. And I think that, that applies on a bigger scale too. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Y'all are so tame. Uh -huh. Here we go. This is a university. <laughs> You're supposed to be attacking us. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing things. No. Thank you. I'm waiting till the young people are finished. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for being here. I recognize you. I now know from where. <laughs> it wasn't Princess me. Diane, uh, uh, sh information documentaries or something. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I know you from, isn't it? Yes. I, I've done some TV. Okay. Anyway, you all have given excellent advice. You really, really have, from my opinion. <laughs> now, you. a funny question perhaps is, you're American citizen, she's a British citizen. How's that working out for you? <laughs> I don't sound like that. <laughs> and I told him the day he starts sounding like this, marriage is over. <laughs> yep, yep. She married me for my accent. I did. <laughs> I did. And sometimes, so he's, he is um, Scots-Irish. So he was born in Ireland, but his mother was Scottish, so he was educated in Scotland. And so sometimes, most of the time I get the, the plummy Cambridge accent. But sometimes I get the, the Scottish burr, and sometimes I get the Irish lilt. And then every now and again he tries to sound American, and it is, it is like Dick Van Dyke in Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> it is just appalling. And I never try to sound British. And when I say Brit, because I lived in London for 17 years and became a subject and was appointed by the Queen and appointed by two prime ministers, and, you know, and, and I engage with British people. And therefore, I have to use British words. And when I use them, they sound ridiculous. You know, the boot of the car, or the, you know, we need to lift the bonnet to check the oil. It doesn't sound like me. <laughs> But I can't affect a, a British accent in any way, shape, or form. But I, I like to think that we're getting the best of, of all world. I certainly feel as if I am. So, uh, and I think that's a, it's, it's a parable for a bigger picture, that mm. in, in a very uncertain world, that relationship between the US and the UK has never been more important. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not blind to its, to its shortcomings or weaknesses, mm -hmm. and it sure as heck could, could do with some uh, tender loving care, it needs constant maintenance. But I do believe uh, that it is the bedrock of the freedoms we all enjoy, and it has to be protected. Thank you. Let's go with one more question, then I think we have to wrap up. Okay. So this is a different kind of brand management, but I was wondering if you had thoughts on how women should portray themselves when running for office, if they should act oh. differently at all? Don't try to be men. And, and don't try to be something that you're not right. because you'll be found out fairly quickly. Um, be yourself. Uh, try to be as articulate as possible. Try to um, communicate in ways that your audience can receive what you're saying, um, not the way that's easiest for you. And, um, and have very thick skin because it is very mean out there. The mean girls of high school never go away. And sometimes they're not girls. Middle school, um, really. Yep, well, <laughs> actually school. primary yeah, now. Right. Uh, you know, they're always there, and there will always be someone who is not liking the way you part your hair, or not liking your makeup, or your lack of makeup, or your choice of footwear. I mean, one of the things I found the most <coughs> stunning, we lost a home. Uh, and the, I am not defending the president and in this moment. I am defending the first lady of the United States. Um, she's, she was a model. She is a billionaire. 
she is going to look a certain way. We lost a home to Hurricane Katrina, so we pay more than passing attention to hurricanes. So she's leaving the White House, and she's wearing, I guess they were Christian Louboutin stilettos, and she looked fabulous. I worked in the White House. I knew she was going to change her clothes on the plane. <laughs> Anybody would know that. that. <laughs> and so for three days, all we talked about was Mrs. Trump's shoes. Aren't there more important mm -hmm. things in the world to worry about yeah, than, North than Korea. what any first lady North or Korea. first gentleman when we ultimately <laughs> right. have one? Right. You know, are they going to subject the husband of the first woman president to this kind of fashion criticism that oh, was he wearing Armani? No. It doesn't matter what she wears. It does matter that she looks nice because right. she is a representative of the United States. Doesn't matter that she you know, has to look like a fashion model with fabulous hair and all of that. It matters that she took the time to present herself well. And you owe it to your public, if you're going to be a public person, to present yourself well. I would add to that only that, that as I learned with, with Princess Diana, women do have an opportunity to communicate with their clothes more than men do. Right. And some of them get it absolutely right, and some of them get it absolutely wrong. <laughs> um, and if you're not getting it right, get good advice. Right. Princess Diana did. She wasn't born with the, this gift for, for fashion as a means of communication. She worked hard at it. She got good advice, and by and large, she took it. Um, deciding on a look and keeping it, back to Maggie Thatcher again, isn't a bad rule. Mm -hmm. And don't imagine, though, that, that men are uh, exempt from this sort of, of scrutiny either. There was a famous uh, uh, cabinet fight, again, under Mrs. Thatcher, but the minister concerned um, staged a very dramatic walkout. He resigned. He was on TV 20 times that day. And some clever person observed, he changed his tie <laughs> six times. <laughs> And every time the tie sent a new message, men, men have these rules too. It's not just uh, uh, something that women have to endure or, or uh, it's not just something that women have the opportunity to exploit. But it is terribly important. And I think is the bottom line is, Mary Jo says, people want to see you've made a bit of an effort. It's courtesy, it's respect. It does matter. When I first joined Drexel for the young um, aspiring investment bankers, we had an image consultant. And I went to one of their, their sessions because, A, I wanted to see what we were teaching these young men and women, but B, I thought maybe I'll get some useful tips for myself because you're, you're never finished. You know, you're always evolving into the, the core of you is the same, but bits change. And the head of investment banking, um, I will not name his name, um, was... Does Glamour magazine still have do's and don'ts, Glamour do's and don'ts? Mm. Women of a certain age, Glamour do's and don'ts. And there would be the, the things that you should do and then the picture of, you know, the things that you should never leave your house looking like. Anyway, the head of investment banking, who was at the time a millionaire, was basically the don't. Because he wore Gucci loafers, and you know, Gucci loafers have that thing that threads through and then the little tassel on the front of the shoe, the top of the shoe. The tassels had fallen off, so he pulled the threads out, and he just had the holes. <laughs> we mocked him. He is now a multi-billionaire. I mock him no more. <laughs> if you want to pull the tassels off your shoes, go ahead. <laughs> But be true to yourself, and he was true to himself. But it, it as Patrick said, it, you have to look like you made an effort, not like you just rolled out of bed from a long night last night and you're showing up to shake hands. Um, people won't appreciate it. Voters won't appreciate it, and they'll see right through it. So be yourself. And the other advice that I would give you, and um, this is not just advice from the most recent presidential campaign, it goes back to one of the early campaigns that I worked on and that Bill Lacey worked on. 
make sure that people understand why you want to be that, hmm. why you're seeking that office. Um, Ted Kennedy is, was a great guy and uh, might have been a good president but he never knew why he should be president and why he wanted to be president. And he got called out for it on 60 Minutes. He couldn't answer the question. Mm. Mrs. Clinton could not answer the question. Before you go for a job, before you go for a political office, make sure you have in your mind why you're doing it and make sure that you can explain why you're doing it, even if why you're doing it isn't what the public explanation <laughs> is, um, in terms that people can understand. It matters. Why do you want to be chairman of student government, president of student government? Why, did, why? Why you versus someone else? You have to know it, and your public has to know it. And if you can't articulate it, you won't succeed. If you can't articulate why you want that promotion, why you want that next job, and what you're bringing to it, you will never succeed. Thank you everyone for being here. Mary Jo Jacoby, Patrick Jefferson, thank you so much. This has been really just a wonderful discussion. Thank you all for being here. Next week we have Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. I hope you'll join us again. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Can I come back for Alan West?